Rotational grazing. It seems like it's all the, the buzz now or the current thing. I got a question. Is it is it really necessary to do rotational grazing for sheep? When I told one person how easy it was to raise St. Croix sheep, he said, well, don't you have to do that rotational grazing thing? What does science say? It's a lot of work. Because if I've got to get water to paddocks up on top of this hill so I can rotationally graze my sheep up on these higher elevations, I'm going to have one heck of a pump to get it from this creek bed all the way up there. And is it even worth it? So a good place to start would be the article on Wikipedia. Because Wikipedia is usually pretty middle of the road. Well, on agricultural topics anyway. But it also backs up uh, with links to articles that will give more credibility. And it'll help you think. For example, here it says that uh, you've got to provide not only food but also water and, and shade and shelter in these paddocks. You just can't leave an animal out in the sun in the middle of the summer. And the article talks about how uh, rotational grazing may be more environmentally friendly, how it may reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And then it talks about a single study that looks at how um, rotational grazing could create a net carbon sink. But also warns that the um, authors themselves say the results are limited in scope and there, it's only one stage of an experimental system. While other studies have found some land may actually sequester just as much or more carbon without any uh, grazing. So because it presents both sides, I, I consider it to be a, a somewhat unbiased source. It also talks about the problems with having a water source in every paddock and how um, as the animals crowd around the water source, they can make a lot of mud, they can uh, spread parasites and have other problems. And it also talks about the need for shade in every paddock, otherwise you're gonna have heat stress on your animals. Then there's a problem with bloat, uh, where if you've got a lot of fresh grass in the spring with rotational grazing, it can cause bloat in uh, some of the animals. And that's a valid consideration I really hadn't thought of until I read this article. But the criticism section really made me think, because some of the scientific experiments on rotational grazing uh, show that it doesn't really work for the ecological purposes that we think it does. There are two methods of uh, running livestock. One is prescribed management, which would be rotational grazing. And the other one is adaptive management, where you look and you see what's going on with the problems and, and try and get a, a better outcome by actually coming up with different kinds of solutions instead of just one, one standard thing that you do. Adaptive management is where you remain flexible, you set goals and challenges, and you monitor the, the outcome and make sure that it works the way you want to, and you come back and you, you, try and, uh, you try and improve the next time around. I didn't realize it, but I never needed to do uh, rotational grazing because I've been doing adaptive management all along. I just didn't know what the term was. So it's really the management model that determines the outcome more so than any one technique. And depending on this management model, plant production has been shown to be equal or greater in continuous grazing operations compared to rotational grazing in 87% of all the experiments that have been made on rotational grazing in various scientific studies. So I had a hard time believing all this and I looked up this link at the end of this, this page in Wikipedia, and here's what I found. This research paper on rotational grazing is based on around a hundred different scientific studies going back to as far as the late 1700s. And what they find is that for some reason there's a perception that rotational grazing is superior to continuous grazing, but it's not backed up by experimental evidence. I'll put a link to this paper in the comments below. In the abstract or overview of the document, they point out that in spite of overwhelming experimental evidence to the contrary, rotational grazing continue, continues to be promoted as the only viable grazing strategy. And so the authors of this document are using all the scientific data that's been collected over like a century uh, to direct the agricultural profession to realize that support for rotational grazing systems doesn't jive up with experimental evidence.
In all these scientific experiments, they found that plant production was equal or greater in continuous grazing operation compared to rotational grazing in 87% or 20 out of 23 of the experiments. In experiments for animal production per head and animal production per area, they were either equal or greater in continuous grazing operations compared to rotational grazing in 92% of the time or in 84% of the time of all these experiments. It goes on to say that this advocacy for rotational grazing is founded on a perception and anecdotal interpretations rather than an objective assessment of this vast experimental evidence. And while rotational grazing was first described at the end of the 18th century in Scotland, it's really from these grazing experiments of the past 60 years that's indicated that rotational grazing is not superior to continuous grazing. In fact, there's experimental evidence that demonstrates that rotational grazing and continuous grazing, they have about the same amount of effectiveness. The conclusions came from major reviews of grazing systems over the last 50 years, and they consistently indicate that rotational grazing is not superior to continuous grazing. From all these studies, the most important thing that comes out is that the stocking rate is the most important thing over which you have control. Uh, the grazing system is not nearly as important as the stocking rate. It's really what determines uh, the success of your animal production operation. And so um, your grazing system is really of minor importance. And so by looking at these studies, they started to realize that this idea that rotational grazing could increase the stocking rate by one and a half to two times compared to continuous grazing, that was completely made up. It's what they call it unwarranted recommendation, there's really nothing to back it up. So to develop this investigation, they only looked at the information that was published in peer review literature because they want to make sure that it was correct and multiple people had made uh, these observations and not just one person came up with this idea. So they grouped all these experiments into three categories. The first is where um, continuous grazing or CG is greater than rotational grazing. Uh, the second one would be where rotational grazing, or RG, is greater than continuous grazing, CG. And the third category would be if there's really no difference between the two, so CG equals RG. Then they grouped this information by studies that had similar stocking rates between uh, the grazing treatments, CG and RG. Uh, those that had greater stocking rates for rotational than continuous grazing, which is what is being alleged, and then they had other studies that had it for all stocking rates combined. So they made this chart which uh, shows how they grouped the experiments together. Uh, on the left column is the plant production or standing crop. The next column is livestock production per head and then livestock production per land area. The key in the center uh, shows where the gray bars are where continuous grazing is greater than rotational grazing. The black bar, continuous grazing is equal to rotational grazing, and the uh, stripe bars where continuous grazing is less than rotational grazing. And the number of experiments for each situation is on the left side of the, of the chart. So looking at the top of the chart where the stocking rate is equal for continuous grazing and rotational grazing, the paper states that 89% of the experiments reported no differences for plant production or standing crop production between rotational and continuous grazing with similar stocking rates. But while the study is talking about the black bar where the continuous grazing is equal to the rotational grazing, uh, the gray bar where continuous grazing is greater than rotational grazing is significantly higher than the stripe bar where continuous grazing is less than rotational grazing. So in most of these experiments where the stocking rate was equal, uh, continuous grazing outperformed rotational grazing, or at least equaled it. And the next group of studies where the stocking rate uh, with continuous grazing is less than rotational grazing, which is what they're alleging. They're saying that you can run one and a half or two times more, more animals on rotational grazing. Here's what, what the study said. When the stocking rate was less for continuous grazing than rotational grazing, 75% of the experiments reported either no differences 
or greater plant production for continuous grazing. So the black bar and the gray bar where continuous grazing was either equal or greater than rotational grazing makes up 75% of this section. And with only 25% of the experiment showing that um, rotational grazing was superior to continuous grazing. This bottom section shows the results of experiments for all stocking rates. And the paper states that across all stocking rates, 83% of the experiments, 19 out of 23, reported no differences for plant production between rotational and continuous grazing. But you can see in the chart where the gray bar, which is continuous grazing produced more than rotational grazing, and all these experiments, there were more experiments that showed that continuous grazing was superior to rotational grazing, uh, except maybe for plant production. But what won in the majority of the cases was the black bar, where there's no difference between uh, rotational grazing and, and continuous grazing. So what are the alternatives to rotational grazing? Well, there's something called adaptive grazing management, which can include rotational grazing, but rotational grazing is usually called prescriptive um, management. So let's take a look at that. Prescribed grazing is a livestock management technique that involves rotating grazing animals through pastures to allow the forage to rest and recover. This is also called rotational grazing, even adaptive grazing, or regenerative grazing. On the other hand, adaptive grazing management is a cyclical process that uses monitoring and feedback to improve grazing and resource management. It's based on the idea that grazing decisions are experiments, that natural systems are complex and variable. Colorado State University put out a guidebook on the principles of adaptive grazing management, which I found to be very interesting. It says that adaptive management is not a grazing management system, but rather a process that can be integrated into a variety of different approaches. And so you're constantly evaluating the outcomes of what you did uh, previously and then try to improve that process. And that's how you're adapting to the conditions. One of the experiments I made was to create a, uh, a winter stockpile field. Now, I didn't mow or cut the grass or let the sheep into this area uh, since July of the, the, year, the previous year. Yet 15 minutes after I turned the sheep in, they walked right back out the gate. They weren't interested in the winter stockpile at all. After the snow lifted, I looked at the uh, grass and there was like no life in it. All the vitamins had been cooked out of it by the snow. It was like cardboard. And so what the sheep were really looking at when they came in to eat uh, was the green stuff underneath it. That's all they wanted. And if I'd forced them in here with rotational grazing, well, yeah, they might have eaten the stuff they didn't like, but that's not going to make them fat because there's not a lot, of, uh, a, lot, a lot of nutrition here. It's all dead. I think there's also a difference between sheep and cattle as far as what they like to eat, and that winter stockpile might work for cows, uh, but not necessarily for sheep. So I uh, will adapt um, and let the sheep come in and eat all the grass they want in October while it's still somewhat green so they can get nutrition and then put them back on the hay and not try and carry a winter stockpile. So that, that's one example of adaptive strategy. Another adaptation is that up on top of the hills uh, where I run all the sheep, I have a tremendous amount of grass that grows uh, more than they can eat, uh, but I also have these weeds. And I can't seem to get rid of them, and I'm not going to be using herbicides. And sheep confined to rotational grazing, they're not going to be eating these weeds. Um, the weeds have been out here for a long time. They don't touch them. I have to bush hog all of it or cut it up with a, with a pickaxe. And so that's not the problem. And you can see there's plenty of grass out here. So there's not an overgrazing problem that's causing these weeds. And my property is what's called in those studies rangeland because... It's never been uh, seeded with fescue. It's never been irrigated or had any herbicides on it. Whatever grows in Tennessee is what's popped up. And so that's, that's what I'm using here. So how do I get rid of these weeds? Um, well, my current adaptation uh, to, to counter this problem is to mow the whole thing. After I mow it, the grass comes in even thicker. And you start seeing clover and other things popping up, but you still see these weeds like an ironweed. 
which has a huge root system. It's a perennial. And there's no real way to get rid of it without herbicides until, until I found or another adaptation to get rid of all of it, which I hope will work. Because what's really causing the problem with my weeds is the pH of the soil. It's not overgrazing, it's, it's pH. And I found a way to determine the general pH for all the different places on my property by going to Soil Web at the University of California at Davis. And I'll put a link down below that will, will take you to this resource. And when I go to my farm, I can see all the different types of soil I have on it. And by clicking on the section that says HW or Huntington, which is the, um, the paddock at the bottom of the hill, and there's no weeds here. It, it's, a, it's a beautiful place. It's very rich farmland. And by clicking on that, it returns all the information about the Huntington um, formation that I have on my property. And by clicking on Huntington, it gives me more information about this formation, including the pH. When I click on the pH, it tells me that um, it's almost 7. It's uh, 6.8 or something like that for the pH. And so that, that's why there's no weeds down here. The pH is really good. When I move the cursor just up the hill a little bit, it takes me into the Del Rose formation. And when I click on Del Rose, uh, it, it brings up information about that, that section, but also the pH. When I click on the pH, it tells me the pH in this area is generally a little bit over 5, like 5.2. So that's probably the reason um, it's got a problem with weeds because the pH is so low. And the adaptive strategy would be to add more lime uh, to change the pH to a more beneficial uh, amount. But I've got these hills that, that I live on. I love the way they look. Uh, I got the land at a bargain price because it was so hilly. But the problem is I try to get any type of, any type of way to lime it. There's no way I could ever use a lime spreader because it's a 37 and a half degree slope and the, the spreader would flip over and, and pull my tractor down the hill and kill me. Uh, the only other option would be to use a cone spreader to spread the lime um, with bags and fill it up with bags or, or however. Uh, but that's a lot of lifting into the back of the cone spreader when you want to put several tons of lime on your property. So that's my latest adapted strategy uh, to add more lime, but I, I don't know how. Um, if you've got some ideas, uh, please leave them in the comments below. One other reason I don't want to do rotational grazing is uh, the time commitment. And that's true also for deworming or trimming hooves or, or all the other things you, they tell you you got to do with sheep. I want a breed of sheep I don't have to do anything to. Uh, they can just come down and they can drink water right out of a spring. Um, and, and then they go and do their business because my time is very valuable. If you spend just one hour a day, and you're, say your time is worth just $25 an hour, one hour a day at $25 an hour times 365 days, that, that equals $9,125. If you sell your sheep for $250 a piece, then you need to sell 36 and a half sheep every year just to recoup the $9,125 you spent in your own time before you even make a profit. And that's why I raised St. Croix sheep because I'm not going to spend all my time uh, either deworming them or, or trimming their hooves or doing famacha test or, or looking at their eyeballs or doing fecal egg counts or, um, or trying to keep up with all that, especially rotational grazing. I'm not going to do it because my time is more valuable. Well, thank you so much for listening to, um, to this video.